Hello, good evening, and welcome to the TNT Show. I'm John Drummond, and I'm your host for the next 60 minutes. Oh, by the way, we're getting awfully close to our 80th show. Well, I must begin, as always, by declaring that this has been a great day for British democracy. We learn that the UK plans to abandon its commitment to the Northern Ireland Protocol that it recently negotiated. Uh, now, for one, I can scarcely imagine the effect that this will have on all the states that presently have treaties with Britain. And why should any state agree to such a treaty or contract if the UK has declared that it may breach its terms? Remember too, that this is the same UK government that is presently trailing its sorry ass across the globe, trying to obtain a sign up for countries to such treaties. In other words, they're trying to effect contracts, having told the whole world that they may well break that contract. Well, what would you do if you were sitting there as another state and, and the bold Liz Trust walked up to your front door and said, we'd like to sign a contract with you for, I don't know, big beans or whatever. But we may breach it, of course. Well, the first thing you're going to do, if you're prepared to consider such a contract, is to have huge penalty clauses. <laughs> which renders the whole thing rather than null and void. Anyway, go figure. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, tonight we are talking to the celebrated journalist Yvonne Ridley. Uh, not only a journalist, but an author and an activist. We'll be discussing her views on the Tory government, feminism, what she thinks of Brexit, and Newcastle United Football Club and its takeover, and why she favours independence. So much more besides. And... She's taking your questions live. Details are on the What's On Guide at whatsonguide.scot. So, the nation talked. And in many respects, this is your show. Uh, we're live and we're free. So, no license, no problem. Now to our guest. The nation talks to Yvonne Ridley. How are you, Yvonne? How has COVID affected you? Um, I'm great and... Um... I'm one of the many who's had COVID, but uh, I was lucky that it didn't affect me. Um, and in many ways, I feel guilty saying this, but I've rather enjoyed lockdown. My husband uh, ran a restaurant in London. And so obviously he um, was closed down for a, a large part of the pandemic and so he spent more time in Scotland. He spent more time with me. So I, you know, quite enjoyed having him around and having him cook for me <laughs> instead of his uh, his customers. So it was um, it was quite a productive period for me. And although I wasn't able to get out and about um, through Zoom and and uh, Skype and all these other wonderful. Um, platforms, I was able to communicate with people. So the world became a much smaller place and, and um, I was able to get out there and, and join in conferences and forums and uh, speak to people that I wouldn't ordinarily get a chance to communicate with. So in many ways, um, it sounds awful, but COVID worked for me. If you can hear a scratching sound, that is my dandy Dinmont um, terrier who is trying to get in. But if I let him in, he'll make even more noise. <laughs> so, no, we'll, we'll persevere, but it seems a great shame on the, the poor dog. Uh, he's, he's just trying to say, I'm friendly and I want to meet your friends. That's all he's trying to say, I guess. But <laughs> I, want, I want to ask you about being captured by the Taliban. But before we do that, tell us a little bit about your career as a journalist, because you started off like many people did in the local press, and then you graduated up to Fleet Street. Uh, and you said to yourself, I have a reputation as Patsy Stone of Fleet Street. How did that all happen? Well, it, um, I didn't say it was one of my friends did, but it's often been attributed to me. Um, I worked hard, I played hard, and that that was, um, you know, I had this great work ethic, 
um, and I would work around the clock until the job was done. Uh, but then I would party as though uh, this was the last day on earth. And uh, so it was quite manic and great fun, or I thought it was. It's all a bit of a blur now. <laughs> but uh, yes, I was quite the, the party girl and quite driven um, in work. And um, I would... Uh, get into to work and and I would uh, work you know and, until maybe seven eight at night I was invariably the last one out of the office and that was from working in the regions right through to um, to when I got down to Fleet Street and you know I was um, after my Taliban experience and I went to work for Al Jazeera. I took, took that work ethic out into Doha and um, it, you know, it, it, it just did not play well. Um, it did not travel well into, uh, into Doha. And so I had quite a few flashpoints with my Arab bosses. And looking back now, um, I think possibly I was in the wrong I didn't understand uh, their work ethics, their work culture. And, you know, something had to go and it was me. <laughs> so I was, um, I was sacked. <laughs> Fleet Street had the, the well-deserved, I thought, reputation for dog eat dog. Oh, yes. That was what journalism was all about. You know, I'm going to get the story because if I don't get the story, oh boy, you know, my world's going to fall apart. Yes, it was uh, very much like that. You know, don't come back to the office without that story. And, uh, you know, some of the punishments, I remember when I worked for the Sunday Times and I was told uh, to get an interview with Jonathan Aitken, uh, the disgraced minister, at any price. And so... I had to sit outside his central London home in Westminster and just watch and wait. And um, there were a few comings and goings, but I didn't see anybody I recognised. And it turned out one of the people who went into the house was his, uh, his wife who was wearing a, a wig and that and and sunglasses and I just didn't recognize her, but a rival newspaper did, and they they got this uh, this picture, and uh, I was um, punished further by having to stay out there for another two weeks to just sit and watch and wait, and and um, of course uh, he he never showed. I mean, it seems to me, I may, I may be wrong, correct me if I am, but it seems to me that that's all pretty much gone now. It's all, I mean, most journalists seem to me like pussycats. You know, the, the editor says jump and they say how high. There's not, I don't, I'm, maybe I'm mistaken, but it seems to me we've gone down a sort of tabloid route, not, not just, by the way, in print journalism, but the broadcast media too. Uh, you know, for example, we had AC Grayling on uh, last week and he said, you know, the BBC never asked me to come on the show because I'm, I'm anti-Brexit. That's it. You don't. That's it. We liked you before. We don't like you anymore. Uh, now, that, that's always been the case. There's always been a line uh, that the, 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 the institution follows, whether it be a newspaper or a broadcaster. It just seems to me there's that bite that you described uh, doesn't seem to be there anymore. Am I mistaken? Well, the newsrooms that I've been in of late are very sterile. Um, there's no phones ringing off the hook. Um, they're very tidy workstations. And it, it's quite a, a different atmosphere as well. Um, and of course, there's no alcohol. You know, there's lots of bottles of water on, on desks, but... Uh, it's quite a, a sterile environment to the to the ones that we were used to, you know, where um, the atmosphere was volatile. Uh, 
the the news editor would shout across the room or throw things at you. There'd be punch ups in the corner, and and it you know it was quite a an explosive um, incendiary arena in which to to work, and that's all gone. How, uh, yeah, how do you work in that environment? How do you sit there at a typewriter or a keyboard, and all this is gone? <laughs> how do you focus? I could never do that. Um, well, I found it quite easy, and and uh, that put me in good, a good stead for uh, working sometimes in war zones um, or other areas where there was a lot going on in the background, and I was able to uh, to block it all out and, and focus on on uh, delivering the story. Uh, usually via phone, via the copy taker, but I don't think there are any copy takers anymore. And everything is just electronic. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it is quite different. I'm not sure I'd be able to enjoy that sort of atmosphere anymore. Yeah. I think what a lot of people watching tonight and listening tonight will want to know, how did you come to be captured by the Taliban? Well, I was very competitive and I always wanted to get the story first and to get the exclusive tag. And there I was in Islamabad, the capital of Pakistan, and um, waiting uh, for this war to start. And there were 3,000 other journalists assembled there. And I'm trying to think, you know, who... Uh, what story can I get that they can't get? And so I decided um, because the Taliban had kicked out all Western journalists from Afghanistan, um, I decided, you know, now's a good time to go in. So I devised a plan with um, my guide, a, a man called Pasha. He was, uh, uh, he was really a taxi driver but taxi drivers are the same the world over. They know what's going on. Uh, they know, you know, they are the go-to people. They know the political temperature. And uh, Pasha was um, amazing uh, with his contacts. And so we decided um, that I would go into Afghanistan the other option was to go to an Al-Qaeda training camp in Kashmir. And he said, if we go in there, I will have absolutely no control and will be very much um, at the mercy of the people inside. And they're giving us assurances, but I, I'm not sure. And I said, oh, well, in that case, let's go into Afghanistan. That sounds a much easier option. And as it turned out, despite being captured, despite being held by them, it was the better call because um, another journalist uh, who I'm sure you've heard of, um, the late Daniel Pearl, he was talking to the same people that we'd been talking to. And uh, he did go into um this Al-Qaeda training camp and, and did trust uh, those people. And of course, he he paid with his life. So although being captured by the Taliban was traumatic, um, obviously what happened to Daniel was far, far worse. So I ended up going into Afghanistan. I was in there for two days uh, to try and find out what life was like under the Taliban. And as I was heading back, um, I was done for by a rogue donkey that I was riding and the, the animal had bolted. And, and um, as I was trying to lean forward to grab the reins to bring this beast <laughs> under control, the one piece of equipment that I'd taken in uh, a camera fell out of the folds of my burqa right in the full view of a Taliban soldier. And I I'm, really can't remember exactly what happened, whether the donkey just stopped and threw me off or whether he grabbed the donkey and pulled me off. But I remember going up into the air and clattering down like a ton of bricks. And as I picked myself up, I'm looking through the grill of this burqa 
at this soldier and he's shouting at me. And he, he obviously wants the camera. And um, so I handed over the camera and then I stood back and closed my eyes waiting to be shot because I had um, bought into the propaganda that this was the most evil, brutal regime in the world. They hated women. So I was waiting to be shot. And after 10 seconds, which is a long time, uh, <laughs> waiting to meet your maker, um, I opened my eyes and he'd gone. He'd gone to find out who had paid for the donkey, who was traveling with this woman, and then he would find out the real culprit for bringing a camera into Afghanistan because photography was banned. So he, he thought that... that <laughs> he didn't like, realize like, I was a like, Westerner. He thought you were a camera mule. <laughs> A camera mule on a mule, yes, I have very, very good. And um, I, th I just realised I can get away. And a group of people were walking past and there were three women also wearing burqas. And I just thought, what's one more burqa? You know, nobody's going to notice. So I joined this group and headed towards the border. And as I looked back, um, I saw the soldier waving the camera in the face of one of my guides. And then another, I'd gone in with two guides and the other guide went to try and calm the situation down. And um, I just thought, well, you know, we agreed if things go pear-shaped, we don't know each other. And so I continued. And then I looked back again a few minutes later and by this time they were surrounded by a crowd of angry men and they were all pushing and shoving and it was all getting very agitated. So I realized that I had to go back because um, I, I don't know, I, I just felt responsible for them. And so I went back and I tried to push my way through this crowd of angry men. And I was just sort of looked at, you know, and swatted away. This was man's business. It had nothing to do with a woman. So I got up and, and went in again. And again, I was swatted back. So I just took off my burqa. I was wearing a shalwa kameez, trousers and a dress um, underneath and I shouted, well, somebody let me through. And suddenly everybody stopped and looked and thought, where's this Westerner come from? What is she saying? <laughs> and it was like the parting of the sea. And I walked towards the Taliban soldier and shouted at him, give me my camera back. And then I threw a quick look at my guides, thinking that they would be looking back in admiration at this brave gesture. And they looked at me as if to say, hmm, we were in trouble before, but now we're in serious trouble. <laughs> they were horrified that I'd done this. And although looking back, the Taliban would have found out because they did develop the film. And of course, I was on the film, so they would have been probably in, in worse trouble um, had I not gone back. I don't know. It, it just, um, it, it was just a mess. And we were rounded up and thrown in a car and, and driven off at um, speed uh, back towards Jalalabad from where we come. And... I was taken into the intelligence headquarters and I answered a few of their questions. They thought they'd got some sort of GI Jane, um, female special forces, super female bond um, character because they didn't recognize my accent. They thought I was an American who was trying to disguise and speak in English. And so I told them about the Geordie accent and that we don't all talk like the Queen. <laughs> so it was um, right from the, the moment of capture, 
right to the point of release. I was terrified. I was also uh, culturally ignorant of, uh, of them and, and they were of me and it, there was a total clash of cultures which resulted in some very dark moments but some very funny moments as well. Um, the could, third you, of, could you speak the language? No, I, I couldn't. You know, typical uh, English person, I expect everybody else to speak the language. This uh, doctor's son, who was about 18 or 19, a young man called Hamid, had uh, the, the misfortune to speak English, Urdu and Pashto. So he was drafted in. And he said to me, these people terrify me and they should terrify you. So please, you know, just be respectful. And it, I had decided um, that I was going to be killed. Whatever the outcome was, everything pointed to me being executed. So I just thought, why kiss the hand that slaps you? You know, um, they're going to kill me. Let's just get it over and done with. And so I became the prisoner from hell. And they were saying to me, you know, why are you behaving like this? Uh, you were our guest. We want you to be happy. And I'm looking at them thinking, why are you behaving like this? Because you're supposed to be brutal, evil and hate women. And, you know, why aren't you following your job description? <laughs> so, as, as I say, it was a complete clash. And um, it, uh, it, it remained that way from, from start to finish. And when they released me on humanitarian grounds, I don't know who was happier, them or me. Um, and, and the Taliban ambassador, Mullah Abdul Salam Zaif, uh, made this press conference. And uh, my mother was told, brace yourself because, you know, they're going to make an announcement and it might not be good news. Mm -hmm. And my mother said, I was sitting at home in the lounge having a cup of tea with all your colleagues. She said there were about 20 in the lounge sitting there. And she said, this poor man came up and said, we are releasing the English woman. She's a very bad woman with a very bad mouth. <laughs> and she said, I was furious. She said, I was really shown up in front of all of your friends. And I said, honestly, mum, I said, um, I didn't swear that much. And I certainly never used the F word or the C word. And she said, what's the C word? I said, never mind. <laughs> Suffice to say, I didn't use it. And it was... Um, it was quite funny, as yeah, she was furious that I'd shown her up. Um. <laughs> so, so, I mean, that, that, that sounds, uh, on one level, it's, it's funny, but your mother's reaction, but at the same time, it's deadly serious. You're right. I mean, I suspect if things had gone pear-shaped, they could have gone uh -huh. pear-shaped fairly quickly and probably yeah. fatally. What, what, if you were, you, you said you had some misconceptions, maybe mm -hmm. a lot of misconceptions about a lot. Taliban. Mm -hmm. uh, what misconceptions do you find are common nowadays? Now the Taliban's in charge of Afghanistan, what do you think is going to happen now? And uh, how do you feel about that? Um, the one thing that I learned about the Taliban, and I have been back to Afghanistan quite a few times since, and I've met up with the leadership uh, since, the one thing that I do know about them is they don't lie. And so if they say that they're going to have women in their government, and if they say that they're going to have a government that is reflective of all the ethnic minorities, including the ones that they used to persecute uh, when they were in power the first time round, then I believe them. And I keep saying to people, uh, when we get a new government in, we usually give them uh, three or four years before we decide whether they're rubbish or not and whether we'll elect them again. You know, the Taliban have only been in power a few weeks. Give them a chance. And, and will the Taliban agree to elections? Well, I don't know whether they will have um, a democracy as we know it. 
Um, you know, what works for us, um, as I discovered, doesn't travel that well um, to different countries. And what they have in Afghanistan, and they've always had, even when they had these governments that the West had put in, um, they have this system called the Lawyer Jirga, which is tribal elders and chiefs representing all areas of Afghanistan who come together and um, have a, a big talk and thrash out ideas. And so I suspect that they'll probably adapt um, their own system that uh, they feel is compatible with Islam. The one thing they will not negotiate on and the one thing th that they will not uh, dilute um, are their Islamic beliefs. And th that's quite clear. Um, happily, uh, education is very, very important in Islam. And although we see crazy cult groups like uh, Daesh and ISIS uh, going in completely opposite directions, um, the Taliban do recognize that uh, education is a right for girls as well as boys. And- Would you uh, describe it as a theocracy? Hmm, I, I, I think that, um, They'll, they'll come up with some form of government. You know, they've been running a parallel government uh, for about the last 10 years in the south of Afghanistan. And it's never been really reported, but they've run their own court systems. They've run their own tax collecting systems. And uh, they have been, you know, running a large chunk of the country. Um, is, is it true that their finance comes, or some finance comes from opium? Is that the case or no? It may, it may have done. Um, but if you look at the sales figures for opium, or the production for opium, it was driven right down and virtually out of existence by 2000 when the Taliban were in power. They... Um, are very much against drugs and alcohol. And uh, they had almost eradicated all of the poppy crops or the opium crops in 2000. Now then, if you look at the production of opium after 2000, it shoots right up. And in fact, it was the one success story in Afghanistan and in fact, I think the opium sales uh, far outperformed the GDP. So it, it uh, and there were rumors, um, I don't know how true it is, that uh, some members of um, the Hamid Karzai government and then the Ashraf Ghani governments uh, certainly benefited from the soaring sales of uh, the opium. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. And I think that this is something that, um, you know, we should be watching, especially in Scotland, where we do have uh, uh, one of the worst drug problems in Europe. Because if the Taliban repeat what they did in the 90s, it means that um, the poppy crops of um, Afghanistan will diminish. And I would imagine that will cause um, a huge spike in uh, the price of heroin on the streets and will increase uh, crime figures. So I think it's something that... Um, you know, the Scottish government really needs to address the drug problem as a, as a matter of urgency, especially now that the Taliban have taken over, because there, you know, will be a direct correlation yes. between drug prices spiking and crime figures rising. <clears throat> I mean, you, you've spoken about their internal politics, if I can call it that. I, what, what's, is it a theocracy? Is it a democracy? Is it a... 
uh, uh, ruled by the elders. What about their external relationships? I mean, if you had to sort of forecast how Afghanistan will now get on or otherwise with other states, uh, how, how would you assess that? I mean, like, how will they get on with Pakistan, India, the neighbours, Russia? Mm -hmm. Well, one of, um, you know, their detractors, which are primarily um, the Kabul um, intelligentsia and, and elite, um, uh, they will portray the Taliban as being tam, as thick as mints, and, and uh, primitive and backward. And uh, this couldn't be further from the truth because the Taliban have been out of power for 20 years. And for them to come back in the way that they did, they have obviously um, put a lot of things in position. They couldn't have swept through the country the way they did without the support of the people inside the country, mm. the poor working classes, peasant classes, mm. you know, um, did uh, not I'm, resist them. I, I'm um, interested in what may happen outside, though. I mean, oh, right. Well, while they were working on yeah. what they were going to do inside, uh, they also started looking at their external relations, and they were quite isolationist in the, in the 90s. And in fact, the world um, turned its back on uh, the Taliban, with the exception of the UAE, Saudi and Pakistan. So this time they weren't going to make the same mistakes. So they've been reaching out for the last year or so, and they have um, secured, I believe, uh, trade deals with their immediate neighbours, China, Pakistan, interestingly, Iran, Shia-controlled Iran. And it shows that um, they have uh, changed their position towards the Shia and they've stopped this sectarianism, um, you know, because they did persecute the Hazara people um, horribly. And so they, um, they've reached out to Iran and by doing so, uh, they've created this trading block, which could uh, emulate the old Silk Road trade route. Mm. And of course, Afghanistan was at the heart of it. That's what started the so-called great game um, in the uh, 18th, 19th century, when the British Empire had its tentacles all over the place. But um, the those that are very um, much against uh, the Taliban settling and, and having a stable government and a secure trading uh, route um, are Saudi, which is vehemently opposed to anything to do with Iran, and uh, Saudi's new ally, Israel, which is having a shadow war with Iran in the Persian Gulf at the moment, and uh, India, which um, wants to keep an unstable relationship between neighboring Pakistan and Afghanistan, because you've got this massive, big, porous border. And if those two neighbors are unstable, then the Pakistan military will have to focus a lot of its forces along that border which means it won't be able to give the attention to the other long border that it has with India and Kashmir. So there's, there's lots of other politics going on, but I think that um, the, uh, the Taliban have secured or put a lot of things in place. They've also got great relations with uh, Turkey, which is a regional power broker and they have the support of Qatar, um, the richest state in the world, which has a lot of soft power and influence as well. So they've got a lot of friends on their side. It would be helpful if America unfroze the bank accounts because um, 
with the billions of of uh, dollars of currency being frozen, um, the civil servants can't be paid, the army can't be paid, uh, the uh, even the charities on the ground. Um, although they might be Western charities, there's no way of sending money uh, safely into Afghanistan at the moment. So even the charity workers aren't being paid. And a friend of mine was describing how he queued for six hours just to get to the cash machine. And when he got it there, it had run out of money. And then another friend who'd queued for the cash machine could only get a limited amount of uh, money out of the machine. What, so, what, so really, what do the cash machines dispense? Do they dispense dollars or Afghan currency? Or, I mean, what? You know, um, well, the, 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 the trading currency seems to be dollars. Um, although it's, it could be, um, do you know it's something that I didn't ask about? Okay. I, We've got a question here from Frankie uh, Mary, uh, and the question is, uh, at what age can girls be married in Afghanistan? And what would Yvonne say is the average age for girls or women to be married? And do girls have any say at all in whom they marry? I mean, this is really important. You know, Afghan culture has been around for centuries, a lot longer than the Taliban. And the life of an Afghan woman isn't uh, that great. Uh, Schoolgirls are um, married off uh, in um, by relatives who see girls as more of a liability uh, than boys. They don't uh, appreciate education, you know, all this talk about uh, the West building schools and and creating um, education for girls. If you look closely at the statistics, um, I think 22% of Afghanistan's women um, can read and and write and get the benefit of an education. Uh, There are still about 4 million children uh, who are not registered at schools. And I remember when a fabulous school was built in Kandahar um, and opened in 2015, they didn't have any teaching staff to go into the schools. Um, So, you know, as usual, the West blunders in, we're going to build schools, they bring in their own contractors. And imagine, you know, in Afghanistan, a place where men desperately need jobs, watching foreigners coming into your country and building and you're thinking well I can do that and why you know why isn't um, why aren't they employing me and this is the trouble with Western aid it always has conditions attached you know use our workforces use our materials use so countries like Afghanistan don't benefit uh, that much so when Uh, presidents and prime ministers stand up and say, we've given billions, we've created schools. You know, the reality is is somewhat uh, different. But um, forced marriages are not um, Islamic at all, but forced marriages are happening in Afghanistan. You're a feminist. How do you feel about that? Well... All of this change has to be brought about uh, through um, awareness and education. And um, unfortunately, it, it's, uh, it isn't or it hasn't happened. The West has had 20 years to get it right, and they've failed miserably. And when... Um, commentators are saying, oh, you know, the poor women of Afghanistan. Well, the poor women of Afghanistan um, have been enduring all sorts of crap all of their life, and it doesn't matter who's in government. And all all these um, 
empowered uh, young Afghan women who were saying, oh, um, you know, the Taliban, our lives are finished now. What I'd love to say to those women is, where were you or what did you do to stop this um, virginity test brought in by the Ashraf Ghani government? Why did you tolerate that? And this virginity test is, is it's incredible. Um, any woman going to court um, as a victim, uh, as a perpetrator, as, as a witness, uh, had to undergo a virginity test, which had no bearing on the legal outcome of whatever case was being heard at the time. And, do, you know, happen, do you know if that happens in any other countries or was it peculiar to Afghanistan? Um, I'm sure it does happen in, in other countries as well. And it's, it's absolutely shocking. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be overly critical of the women in uh, the, the major towns and cities like Kandahar, Herat and, and Kabul, um, because, you know, it, it's not that easy to stand up and, and protest but um, please don't pretend the life of an Afghan woman was fantastic before the Taliban arrived, because it wasn't. Yeah. And I'm, you know, the the, the treatment of women um, in Afghanistan is very tough. Yeah. Could, could I? Could I? Let, we we'll look. We'll, obviously, we need to look and see what happens as the Taliban mm. government develops as it grows into it and see if that, what effect of any of that has on what you've just described. Can we move on and, and talk about the Respect Party? Now, you were a member of the Respect Party. Yeah. <laughs> and so was George Galloway. Now, uh, you support independence. Uh, it, it would be hard to describe George as an independence supporter. Uh, how did you all get on? I mean, how did that happen? And, and how do you feel about the Respect Party now? I think that the Respect Party was ahead of its time. I mean, you look over the border in England and I just weep. You've got the Tories, uh, this Bullingdon club on steroids, out of control. And you've got um, this pale version of new labor from Blair's days um, where you could, it would be very hard to uh, separate labor and Tory policies. You know, they seem to meld into one. And I, I think that, um, that people in England are desperate for a new party. Well, that, that, that was the point that Anthony Grayling made last week. He, he very eloquently said the left is a mess. Mm -hmm. uh, the main reason it's a mess is because the Labour Party can't get its act together and cannot uh, form a progressive alliance uh, with other parties because, as he pointed out very eloquently and I thought straightforwardly, uh, th this is, in electoral terms, and votes, uh, is a minority government. We have a minority government in Westminster. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it forms the government because of first past the post, mm -hmm. which produces skewed results. But there's nothing new about that. It always did produce skewed results. Uh, I, I, and that calls for statesmanlike approach. It calls for the leader of the Labour Party to reach out, as he said, to the other parties and say, look, together we can get rid of this lot. <laughs> uh, apart, we'll never get rid of them. Uh, and he said... Nothing is happening. It's just not happening. Um, now, it'd be very difficult for people in Scotland to get together with George Galloway because he says, you know, to the majority party, I don't like you, I don't want any part of you, I will not cooperate with you. So how would that possibly have worked, even if it had been successful? Well, when, when Respect um, first launched, you know, it wasn't just George Galloway's party. We had some amazing people in like George Monbiot, uh, the environmentalist. We had uh, Ken Loach, the um, I, Daniel Blake film director. And, and um, we had some really uh, great uh, leading lights in there who were, you know, at the top of their field, if it was climate, environment, um, 
socialists, good, good uh, old fashioned socialists. And it was a party for everybody. And it, it really captured the imagination. And we stood candidates in every um, area in England uh, for the European elections. And it, it, you know, we, it was incredible. And we had this real momentum. And then unfortunately it, um, it crashed. And I, th I think one of the watershed moments was uh, George Galloway's decision to um, enter the Big Brother house. And he hadn't discussed it with anybody. The first we knew was when we turned on our TV sets. Um, I spent a fortune trying to vote him out. You know, it was, <laughs> it was like, what, what are you doing in there? And... Um, there are arguments going on today, wh whether it was a wise decision or not. On the one hand, um, he used the money, uh, the fee that he was given uh, to expand his Westminster office. Um, on the other hand, um, it, it, it had a very negative impact uh, with a large number of um, our executive committee. Um, then on the other hand, it also uh, gave um, working class viewers a chance to find out about respect. Although, uh, of course, uh, there was all this bird song and, and uh, every time George spoke, so nobody got to hear what he was really about. And they just saw this man humiliating himself with Rula Lenska, yep. you know, I'll be the cat okay, in, that, that, taking that, the cream. I take your point. George is a, a law unto himself. Mm -hmm. uh, but what was the respect party's position towards Scottish independence? Do you remember? Um, we didn't have anything to, we didn't have anyone in Scotland at the time. Um, and well, George was quite firm about that. He said, uh, we don't need to go into Scotland. They've already got um, the SNP. So, um, you know, it's an alternative to Labour. And he said that there would be nothing to gain by going into Scotland. Of course, that was the George back then. I don't recognise the George Galloway um, that I've seen over the last 10 years. We haven't fallen out. We just haven't spoken. <laughs> I just, um, the, the moment that he called um, the Syrian president, uh, Bashar al-Assad, uh, the lion of the desert, um, that was enough for me. And... Uh, so, yes, I, um, but by that time, I, you know, I'd seen some things that I was very unhappy with. And, and so I resigned my position from the, the party and um, moved to Scotland. Now, having moved to Scotland, we, we've got about just over 12 minutes. Um, why do you support Scottish independence? Because for the last... 15 years before then, um, I had sat and watched Westminster up close and personal. I'd seen the corruption over the expenses, the sleaze, the, um, you, you couldn't tell Labour uh, from the Tories. Uh, it, it was just a cesspit of, um, of sleaze and, and corruption and nepotism and uh, there was nothing inspiring with the exception of a few people um, like Jeremy Corbyn, like the late Gerald Kaufman, like the late Tony Benn. Um, it was just a mire. And when I heard that uh, Scotland is getting its act together and it, it, they're talking about a referendum, I thought I'm, I want to be part of that. And I, in, in 2011, I moved up uh, to Scotland and, um, and threw myself wholeheartedly 
into the the campaign for independence. Some of the questioners are asking about detail. They're saying, do you think 2023 is too late for a referendum, considering the Tories are taking a lot of the powers away from all the devolved administrations? Now is the time. I'm firmly convinced now is the time. The longer we leave it, the worse it's going to get. You know, um, we've seen what happened with the Taliban simply because people underestimated them. Um, We look at the Tories there, we call them an absolute mess. All these public school boys, Boris Johnson is crazy, Um, but don't underestimate them. They will be putting building blocks in place And uh, I I fear that uh, we could end up in a Catalonia situation um, because of the Tories. You mean, do you think that the the British government would put troops on the streets in Edinburgh? I I wouldn't put anything past them. And furthermore, um, Boris Johnson would get the support of the English if he did that as well. He has captured the imagination of the working classes. They love him. And wow. it, it, uh, and, Why is that, Because uh, you're an intelligent woman. You've been in politics for some time. Mm-hmm. You're a journalist, so you've got your finger on the pulse. That's your job. That's what you get paid to do. And, and yet, here's a bunch of people that most people would have credited as being grounded in common sense, accepting a uh, rule by someone who is as alien to them mm-hmm. in, in terms of background and experience as it's conceivable. He makes be. them laugh. He makes them laugh with his bluff and bluster and cut, you know, twirling his hair and he's a mess and he's, uh, and, and you say to people, how on earth can you support this man? Oh, it's Boris. Oh, it's just Boris. This is Boris. You know, he's, and he, he, can get away with murder at the moment. No, no, I, I no, think no, this. No, no, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and I, we we all appreciate a good laugh, and and, and, mm-hmm. and no reason to believe that uh, the working class in England and Scotland equally enjoy a good laugh. But nonetheless, mm-hmm. we are looking at a situation here now where people are going to be considerably worse off going into winter. Supermarket shelves are emptying. Uh, we can't get our our ports are choked. Uh, the containers are going elsewhere. Um, Ireland is increasingly a much more attractive place to do business with. Uh, so jobs will, will gradually disappear. Uh, we're still not through COVID. Uh, we've still got the full effect of Brexit to come. Uh, th- this is not a laughing matter. No disrespect no. to anyone here. Uh-huh. Well, I, I think that... Um Gosh, I'm going to upset a lot of people. I think that the electorate in Scotland is a lot more savvy than the electorate in England. And unfortunately, by the time the electorate in England wakes up to the disaster that is the Tory party, it will probably be too late for them. Um, And, you know, at the moment, Boris is making them laugh. I think sooner or later he'll make them cry. But what is the alternative? There is no alternative at the moment. Um, Keir Starmer is seen as as, um, another posh guy, another posh white bloke who doesn't have the charisma or the humour of Boris. He doesn't make anyone laugh. Um, You know, least of all people within his own party. So... uh, I just look at English politics and I'm just desperate, desperate for Scotland to get independence um, for our cousins in England, because I think we would raise the bar immediately. And that's when people would say, hang on, why are they getting that? Why are they doing that? Why can't we do that? And it would help lift the situation in England as well. Um, if you know when we get independence, we will get independence, that's for sure. But um, we we need to be working at it now and not waiting until twenty twenty three. What do you think of Nicola Sturgeon? How does she strike you? 
I used to think she was brilliant. I thought that uh, she was a fantastic um, support act to Alex Salmond. And when he did the honourable thing and, and stood down, um, it was natural that she would take over. And uh, it was as though she would steer the ship in the same direction. But it's quite clear that she has surrounded herself with a duplicitous, treacherous set of people. And uh, rather than steer the ship, they've been weighing anchor. And, and um, when I turn around now to other supporters of Nicola Sturgeon, I'll say, what has she achieved since she became the leader? Well, the, you know, the, the, the how has she promoted um, independence? The, the, the counter argument, if I can put it, is uh, you can do what you like in terms of independence. You can have a referendum, you can say mm -hmm. Supreme Court, you can just say uh, we're declaring ourselves independent, <laughs> a bit like Estonia and Lithuania. But the reason that those situations proved to be successful is because the international community, including the UK, in the case of Estonia and the Baltic states, said, hey, right on, we're with you. In other words, you need to build up, the argument goes, an international consent with a small C perhaps, maybe disguised consent, there would be unstated consent, but it's there nonetheless. So that when you do pull the trigger, these folks immediately weigh in by saying, hey, this is cool, we can live with this. That's the counter argument. You, and you can't do that overnight. You have to spend years doing that. It, it's mm -hmm. soft. It's not straightforward. It's it's a, a nod here, a wink there, all the rest of it. What do you say to that argument? Um, it, it, we should have secured that already. We should have secured this support. It's interesting that the, and of course I declare an interest at this stage, I have left the SNP and I've joined the Aleppo party. Oh. But it is interesting that the Aleppo party has actually reached out already and made some soft inquiries with strategic um, people in Europe. And they have discovered that they have not been approached by the SNP. So the SNP hasn't even been doing, you know, quiet, softly, softly. If we do this, will we get that? If we go here, will we get this? And they haven't done that. And you can't just spring a referendum and then expect Europe to say, yes, we need to have made those strategic alliances. And, um, and she hasn't done that. And I am amazed that somebody who was mentored by Alex Salmond all these years has picked up none of his um, acumen or str uh, key strategy, nothing. And I sent her a tweet um, just a few weeks ago, and I really meant this as a friend. You know, do you really want to be known as the SNP leader who cost us independence? And I really fear that, you know, I'm a, a big woman supporter. I'm a feminist. I, I want to see Nicola Sturgeon walk on water and do amazing things. But frankly, she's been a huge disappointment. And looking at her at the moment, um, she's obviously been wrung out with the pandemic. And, and, and uh, she's made the same mistakes in the pandemic that Boris Johnson made. She should have closed the border straight away and really brought us into a real lockdown well, as, soon as, um, it, as soon as we realised how serious it was. I mean, it's a fair point, but the reality is, Yvonne, if you're a devolved administration, you can't close the border because the parent group, the sovereign group, then chokes off your funds and they bring you to heel. So it, 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 it sounds... It sounds like the right thing to do, mm -hmm. but to be rendered penniless at the very time you're in the middle of a, a, a pandemic, it, it, it just, I mean, I, I, I could see this, this, the simplistic view of it. It's just, just mm -hmm. chop. 
the reality is that if somebody else is holding your purse strings, you're pretty much screwed. I mean, you really are. Uh, but I'm not making. I'm not unless making you've made it. unless you've made strategic alliances of, of in course, the meantime. And, and you've done um, that. We, we, you know, we've, we've almost run out of time, everyone. This has been great. I've, I, I hope everyone has enjoyed it as much as I have. It's been very, very educational. Are there any last thoughts you would like to leave our audience with, the folks who are watching and listening right now, uh, for Afghanistan and for Scotland? Um, with Afghanistan, we have to keep talking. We might not like the Taliban. Um, as, as I said in the Aleppo conference, they like us as much as we like them. Uh, but we must keep talking because if we don't, if we isolate them, look what happened the last time. Afghanistan became a playground for every wannabe jihadist. Now, um, with Scotland, uh, we, as, as the people have to get together all under one banner, for instance, fantastic title. You know, we need to show our support uh, at, at their next rally and, uh, and take a lesson from the Arab Spring. When you go out and you march, don't go back home until you get what you want. And really, we need to, to get a new strategy because it's all very nice and fine having a couple of hours of marches, some rousing speeches and somebody singing Flower of Scotland and then we all go home happy. Um, we've got to change our strategy. Good and point. I think we've got to march and, and not go home and just stay there and demand and demand <laughs> and, until, we can, uh, until we can get what we want. Fair point. I can't let you go without talking briefly about Newcastle. <laughs> Because there's a whole bunch of folks out there thinking, hey, what happened to Newcastle? Yeah, I have supported that club since I was a kid. Uh, when <laughs> when the, the were, everybody had to stand to watch the game and, and sporting greats like Bobby Moncur and Jinky Jim Smith and all of those uh, great uh, heroes. Um, the issue of human rights has now come to the forefront. We're stuck with the Saudis. I've said um, you can buy our club, but you can't buy our silence. And in fact, I um, on the first day of the season, I went out and give, gave out these leaflets for my friend, Dr. Ahmed Mustafa, who has been disappeared by the Saudi regime. And uh, the Saudis buying the club, well, if somebody throws lemons at you, make lemonade. So I have been raising the issue of human rights. And we have people on the football terraces discussing human rights. And, and so um, if we can keep that talk going, who knows, we might even be able to influence uh, the Saudis that if they want to be accepted by the greatest fans in the world, um, they're going to have to start to uh, be more progressive and more friendly when it comes to human rights. Last, but by no means least, Caledonia, your, your book, your three-part. Oh, right. Yes, I heard. Um, this is the, the book, The Caledonians. This is the first uh, one. It's called Mr. Petrie's Apprentice. The next one, which is coming out, is called The Sinclair Curse, but I don't think that will come out now until next year. And uh, what the thing that the Caledonians has taught me, um, writing it, is that uh, we need to have Scottish history as a compulsory subject within the curriculum, because the amount of Scots who don't know about their own history is astonishing. Um, there's more to Scotland than Bannockburn. <laughs> but I'm sure most of your viewers know that um, anyway. Well, as James Hawes pointed out, that also applies south of the border because, as he said, when he looked, he, he, you know, John Haw, Haw, James Hawes wrote a book called The Shortest History of England, uh, that at Bannockburn, uh, both the leaders spoke French. <laughs> <laughs> but the I, troops, I, the troops, I do. The English troops spoke English and the Scottish <laughs> troops spoke. Anyway, uh, it's, it's been great. Thank you very much indeed. I, I, I really appreciate it. We've overrun a little bit, but I'll, I'm sure people will, will forgive us for that. Yvonne, that's been fantastic. Please stick around for a wee bit. I'm just going to make a few closing remarks, if uh -huh. I may. Uh, 
uh, right. to the effect that uh, a big thank you to Yvonne and a big thank you to all of you uh, for watching and listening tonight. I hope you've enjoyed the TNT show. As ever, we have formidable guests. We have the people that the BBC will not, they're too frightened to put them on. We, we, it's, we want to hear from people. How, how can you know what's going on in life unless you talk to people? And if you simply talk to all the people who agree with you, then what the heck, of, what chance do you have of learning what's going on, what's really going on? So look out next week, because we're back at the same time, 7 p.m. on Indie Live, The Nation Talks to Jackie Kemp, uh, journalist and uh, all-round good heck. Uh, do listen, do join us for, for Jackie. And please, always, as a reminder, uh, look out for my Constitution column in the Sunday National this weekend. You'll find the Constitution column tucked away at the back of the seven-day supplement. And I'll be talking a little bit about the Labour Party being unable or unwilling uh, to present a progressive front, as we were discussing with Yvonne, and as we discussed last week with Anthony Grayling, and what that tells you about the prospects for removing the present uh, administration in Westminster. Uh, thank you again. Uh, it's great always to be here. Join us next Wednesday. Remember, it's been a great day for British democracy. Uh, on the day the government is heavily slammed for its COVID response, we find out the Prime Minister has leapt into action by taking to his sunbed on the Costa del Sol. So to all of you, thanks for joining us. Stay safe and take care. Good night all.